Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at the Mead LX200 series. The most popular models include the 8-inch, the 10-inch, and the 12-inch. And we've got the 7-inch Mac here for good measure. Now, of course, the Mead LX200 series is one of the most popular, most iconic, and most important telescopes in our hobby today. In fact, when you say the word Mead to me, I immediately think of the LX200. So let's take a closer look. So the LX200 series came out around 1994, and immediately there was a seismic shift within our hobby. It is difficult to overestimate or overstate the importance that this model had on amateur astronomers. Now, there had been attempts at computerized telescopes before, but none of them had really taken hold, and none of them worked nearly as well as this model. You know, and I remember when these things first came out, a lot of the discussion about these things had nothing to do with how they worked or you know, what you do with them or what you could see with them. There was a lot of like moral debate about all of this. You know, people were mainly older astronomers saying things like, you know, I spent 50 years learning the night sky and now you're telling me all I have to do is push a button and the thing just goes there by itself. You know, if I see one of these out in the field with somebody who owns one of these, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. You know, the Astronomical League had to put a notice up on their website that if you were seeking your Messier certificate, a device-aided observation was considered invalid. So there's a lot of hand-wringing going on around this time about what are we going to do about all this? What does this mean for our hobby? Well, of course, times have changed. And today, computerized telescopes are not only accepted, we expect to see them out in the field. Now, since 1994, there have been many different versions of LX200s, but very broadly speaking, there are three types. Now, within these three types, there are subdivisions, of course, but just very broadly speaking, we can think of three different types of LX200. The first one is this original model, the sometimes referred to as the LX200 Classic, and this is very easy to spot because of this blocky controller with the membrane keypad. Now, around the mid-2000s, Mead began to take advantage of certain technological advancements, and you had these GPS models featuring this now familiar AutoStar controller. There have been several different versions of the AutoStar controller here. And on the 10-inch, this is the GPS module. Several quality of life improvements have been made along the way. One of them, for example, is this declination cable that goes to the declination housing. It's internal here. Lots of little improvements there. The GPS unit did make initializing your alignment a lot easier. The third iteration is the ACF model. That's the advanced coma free model. I don't have one of those here right now, but cosmetically they're pretty similar to these two that you see here. And uh, the, up, there have been upgrades in the optics and certain quality of life improvements in the software as well. But that's the third version of the LX200. Okay, so if you want to see this thing work, let's go ahead and use this eight inch here. I've done a dummy align indoors it thinks it's pointed at the Pleiades. Yeah, don't say anything to it. But if I wanted to, for example, go to M44, the Beehive cluster, I would just hit enter and then go to, and the thing would move there by itself. Now you're hearing one of the criticisms about the early models here, they're loud. In fact, some people refer to these things as the coffee grinder. Okay, so like I said, these are the three most common sizes, the eight, the 10, and the 12. Most people have the 8-inch model. These things were not, and even today, are not cheap. You can see this ad from a 1996 Sky and Telescope magazine, $2,795. The 10-inch is a few hundred dollars more, and the 12-inch is over $4,000. To get today's dollars, you almost want to double those figures. So it was a significant investment for somebody looking for one of these telescopes. So the 8 is actually, to me, the most reasonable model. What's above the tripod here weighs around 41 pounds, just starting to get a little bit unwieldy for one person to move. The 10 inch here, uh, a lot of people went for these because they're only a few hundred dollars more, but what's above the tripod here weighs 58 pounds, a little bit more unwieldy for one person. So the 12 inch here, it took two of us to get it up here, is 71 pounds above what you see on the tripod. And it's not just that it's 71 pounds, it's an awkward 71 pounds that you have to lift up to waist level and put on that flat plate without the thing tipping over.
Okay, so let's go through some tips and tricks should you wind up with one of these telescopes. One of the first things I tell people to do is replace the stock visual back that comes with the telescope. Both Meade and Celestron for many, many years supplied this cheap piece of stamped steel. Now keep in mind, anything after the visual back you are entrusting to this one tiny set screw, I've seen those things let go. Now what I like to do is put a two inch threaded visual back on the back of the telescope and then you can put a two inch diagonal and sleeve it down if you have to to an inch and a quarter. The other thing you can do, and this one has this, it's, a, it's an SCT specific diagonal that threads onto the back and it has a diagonal attached to it. I have a slight preference for the two inch tube on its own because it is slightly easier to rotate the eyepiece. Now secondly, if anybody's ever put one of these things together, you know the moment of truth is when you pick up the optical tube assembly and set it on the base because you've got to thread this bolt and you'll see the bolt here on all four of these telescopes. You've got to thread it into the bottom of the, uh, the fork arm assembly. The problem is you can't see where the hole is on the fork arm assembly. Now on the eight, it isn't too bad. You can kind of slide it around and move and feel. By the 10, it's getting to be a little bit cumbersome, and the 12 is just downright scary, because if you don't set it down right, and you don't get it in, you have a tendency to push it around, you could just push it right off the plate. So one of the first things I tell people to do is to buy this Peterson top plate, and it's got these guide pins at the back, and when you slide the optical tube inside, it goes in perfectly every single time. You don't have to worry about it falling off. Okay, for those of you worried about mechanical stability, now the eight and the 10 are the same in that the optical tube will swing through like this and you can store it and move it this way and that is, get this keypad out of the way, that is convenient. Now, some of these are good because you can store it in the case like this, but in the event of the seven, you're gonna see that it's too long, it does not swing through and the 12 is the same way. It, can't really get it down in here. Now, there is a mechanical stop here that will prevent you from going too far down. I wouldn't put too much faith in that thing. Just don't swing this thing down. One minor thing to note about the keypads is the original LX200 Classic keypad has the three over three number keypad like a calculator with the one, two, and three on the bottom. But by the time they went to the AutoStar controller, they went to the telephone style with the one, two, three on the top. Now, if you're a normal person who only has one telescope, this isn't gonna be a big deal to you. But if you're me and you have to keep switching from one system to another, it can get pretty confusing. Another plus if you're buying used is if the telescope has been equipped with Bob's knobs. Now Bob's knobs are these plastic knobs that you can turn with your finger on the secondary assembly so you don't need any tools. Now some people feel one of the disadvantages of Bob knobs is that it actually makes the secondary go out of collimation faster, but the advantage of course is you can get it back in faster. Now I've got Bob's knobs on this telescope here and I found even with some driving it around, it maintains collimation pretty well. Another thing you wanna be aware of, if you have one of the very old models, those ran on 18 volt DC. Now they later changed to 12 volt DC the way everybody else does, but the early ones ran off of 18 volts. This is one of them. This is a dongle that converts 12 to 18 volts so that you can use it. This piece often goes missing. Now, can you use 12 volts on an 18 volt system? I've done it. I know people who do it. You're gonna find some differing opinions online as to this issue. Yes, people do it. I've done it. I prefer to use the correct voltage that the system was designed for. Cases. Is there a good and convenient way to store these things? Yes, there have been a couple of solutions in the past, and one of them is this canvas overcase that uses the packing foam that came in the carton to begin with, and it just kind of zips around the thing. Mead had them, and there are other suppliers as well. Those are reasonably cost-effective, and I actually like this solution a lot. If you're partial to hard cases, JMI has you covered. These are beautiful products and they protect your telescope really well and I like them a lot. The disadvantage of these, the cost. The eight inch is somewhere around $580. The 10 inch, which is what this one is here, is $850. And if you wanna buy the case for the 12 inch, it's gonna set you back a cool 1100 plus dollars.
Here's a question I get a lot. Should you buy old LX200s? I'm seeing a lot of these classics come on the market, sometimes at very attractive prices. Should you buy one? The answer, not surprisingly, is yes and no. <laughs> it depends on your tolerance for possibly defective electronics that age over time. What is the number one complaint I have against LX200 models? In one word, reliability. Now, some people go through their entire lives and these things work forever. I think that's terrific if you have one of those. That has not been my experience with most of these. In fact, of the three Schmidt Cassegrains that you see here, all three of them were dead when I got them. The 8-inch here had a bad declination, something going on, it would not move up and down at all. Scope Wizard was in fact able to fix that after replacing some boards and doing some other modifications. The 10 here, the main problem with this one is that the level north sensor is broken. Either the sensor or the board is not functioning any longer. Now you don't actually need that, but if you want to do the easy align where it uses the GPS, it just finds things by itself, you are going to need that because it has to level itself north. And if it doesn't have a level north sensor or if it's broken like on this one, it never does that. It spins around, it stops, it trips out on a fault code. However, you can continue to use this thing in normal two-star alignment mode. And the 12 inch here, well, this thing didn't work at all when we first got it. Uh, you know, so Scope Wizard is adamant about this. If you have an LX200 Classic and you know it hasn't been powered up for a while, he says don't even think about turning this thing on until you replace at least three capacitors inside. There are two tantalum capacitors inside the keypad. Those are those brown-orange things there. And there's one inside the control panel, which may be a tantalum capacitor. It may be an electrolytic capacitor. It needs to be replaced as well. The problem with capacitors is when they haven't been powered up for a long time, sometimes they will blow when suddenly exposed to power. When they blow, sometimes they'll take the circuit board with them. And on these older models, me doesn't support these things anymore. They don't sell any more spare parts. You're stuck going to the used market and finding used parts. You know, who knows what you're going to find there. Aside from that, the most common failures I find are jacks and switches going bad on the control panel. This is not just Mead, this is everybody. Now, if the drive base does fail and you can't fix it, you're stuck with just an optical tube, but that's okay because Mead, Schmidt, Cassegrain and optical tubes are very robust, reliable, and I find they actually have very fine optics. So I have no problem doing this. And in fact, I actually prefer this. On the 10 inch here, what you can do is you can defork the optical tube from the mount, and then you put a D plate and radius blocks underneath it. This way you can put it on any equatorial mount of your choosing. It's actually more versatile that way. And this is again, the way I prefer to use these things. Again, reliability problems on the drive bases of LX200s have plagued me since day one. This brings to mind a very old, cruel joke that I once heard. I'll give you $500 for your eight inch Meech mid and optical tube assembly. If you throw in the LX200 mount, I'll give you $400. A common question that comes up, how accurate are LX200s? How accurate are the pointing systems? Well, to me, they're pretty consistent throughout the years. I think they've gotten a little bit better on the newer ones, but they will occasionally miss. This is what I expect, but I find that many beginners feel that they're expecting the thing to be a little bit more accurate than it actually is. Keep the magnification low, and most of the time the object will be somewhere in the field of view, if not exactly centered. Now, a convention for many years in Mead that if you, the device, if the object is not perfectly centered in the eyepiece, you can press and hold the enter key. This synchronizes the telescope within that area of the sky, increasing its accuracy in that part of the sky. While I do appreciate that feature, it is at least a tacit admission from me that the electronics are not perfectly accurate. Now, as time went on, they implemented other software tricks that increase the accuracy, and I've had mixed results with those as well. So keep in mind here one thing. I used to sell industrial motor control for many decades. High precision motors and encoders can easily run you into five figures, and sometimes even more than that in a very critical application like pharmaceuticals or hospital or paper mills and this sort of thing, 
It has to be exact and it can't be off by just a little bit. So if this is a commercial grade encoder motor system, it's going to be off by just a little bit every once in a while. Okay, how much are these things worth on the used market? This is tricky because supply and demand changes all of the time. What you're willing to pay, a good condition one versus one that you've never seen before, things can get a little bit nebulous here. But here's what I always tell people. On an older model that is more than about eight or nine years old on an LX200, I no longer have a lot of faith in the drive bases. When the LX200 gets to be over eight or nine years old, it's worth what the optical tube is worth. If the mount works, that's fine, but I'm buying the optical tube. So in other words, what I'm saying is for an eight inch, 500 to $800 for an LX200, for a 10 inch, 750 to $1,500, and on the 12 inch, 1,000 to $2,000. Now notice those numbers are a lot lower than what you're going to see elsewhere on the internet and sellers don't always like it when I say those things, but that's what I'm willing to pay and that's what I'm advising that you pay. If you think those numbers are low, ask yourself this question. Let's say you paid more than those numbers that I said and three months later, a year later, the drive base dies and you can't fix it. Are you still happy with what you paid for the telescope? So again, my concern is mainly for the drive bases, which I find to be less reliable. The optical tubes, they're great. I like all of these things. If you buy an old LX200 and everything works, you know, it can be a lot of fun for a while. If the drive base dies, you know, the fun stops for a while. But you can always defork the optical tube, put the D-plate and radius blocks on it, put it on an equatorial mount, and the fun can begin again. So again, I do like all of the Meech Metcastigrain optical tube assemblies. These are not the only ones they made. This is the 8, the 10, the 12, and the 7-inch Mac. They also made a 14-inch, a 16-inch, and very briefly, a 20-inch. I don't have any of the big ones here, and if I did, I wouldn't have dragged them up here. Too much of a hassle. So again, the optical tubes are all recommended, but there are two versions that I might want to steer you away from. One of them is the F6.3 models that they made somewhere in the late 1990s to the early 2000s in response to imaging. They were trying to get things to move a little bit faster for imaging. Those models are inconsistent at best. The second model I might want to steer you away from are the early RCX models. These are the precursors to the ACF models, the advanced coma-free models that we know today. The early RCXs were large, they were expensive, and they had to stop using the words RC because that's intellectual property owned by somebody else, so that's why RC turned into ACF. The RCXs did not have a very good reputation. My personal experience with those is spotty, but the few of those that I have seen, uh, they weren't working. Let's talk about the Mac for just a moment. The 7-inch F15 Maxitov was available in Mead's catalog. It went in and out for quite some time. It appears to be out permanently, at least for the time being. I really hope they bring this thing back in Mark II form. So this is an interesting and quirky and full of character telescope. And I've gone on record as saying that this could be my favorite Mead telescope of all time. Now, I wouldn't say that I would recommend this as a first or only telescope for somebody, although if you wanted to, you could use it that way. Maxitov's excel at lunar, planetary, and double star work. If that's you, you might want to consider picking up a Maxitov of some kind. So people who know these things know what I'm about to say. <laughs> There's one fatal flaw in this thing, and it comes from Mead's annoying tendency through the years to reuse and recycle parts in the name of saving money. <laughs> so the Mac is actually using the same optical tube diameter and the same fork mount as the 8-inch schmidt cassegrain It may not seem that way. It's an optical illusion because the Mac is longer and the aspect ratio looks a little bit different. But it's actually the same, and I'll prove it to you here. So here's the lens cap off of the 8-inch schmidt cassegrain and as you can see, it it fits the seven. The fork arms are also the same. Now, because they're using the same fork arms, where they have to put this thing on here, they have to slide the thing all the way back to the point where uh, you have to make sure that the diagonal in the eyepiece clears the drive base at the zenith. Because of that, and because Macs are longer, and because the corrector plate 
weighs a lot more than a Schmidt corrector plate, the thing is no longer balanced. And when it's no longer balanced, they had to put a giant weight in the back here. This weight causes so much consternation among Mead Mac owners. What are they going to do about this thing? First thing, it makes the thing really heavy. This looks like it weighs probably about as much as the 8-inch Schmidt caster grain. It actually weighs closer to the 10-inch. <laughs> this is 52 pounds above the tripod. That's 58. That weight weighs a lot. The second problem with the weight is it hoards heat. The last thing you want in a Maxitov. So there is an excellent article on Cloudy Nights about how to remove that weight in the back. Uh, I'll warn you, it's not for beginners. The problem is the plate has to come off and the weight has to come out of the front. So you pretty much have to disassemble the whole telescope. I'm telling you, I am not comfortable performing that operation. But if you're handy, you want to do that, by all means, do so. Okay, so any or all of these are recommended, provided you understand the caveats that I've described before, but there's really one of these that I recommend above all of the others. And it's not surprising, it would be the 8-inch. It really is the best combination of price, performance, and portability. Now, if you already have an 8-inch, you can go for one of the bigger ones. The 12 would be the obvious choice because it's about a magnitude apart. Just be aware, Aperture Fever does come with a price. Now, I'll tell this story. I got this one here. The person who bought this owned it for over 20 years. He had to have the biggest telescope that he could find at the time. This was it. He used it twice. <laughs> he died before being able to use it a third time. And through a complicated series of events, it wound up with me. So do keep that in mind. Okay, so I hope you found this information useful. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.